Greetings everyone. Uh, today with us we have uh, Professor Jamshed Barucha, the founding uh, Vice Chancellor of Sai University and the President Emeritus of uh, Cooper Union, New York. He completed his PhD in Psychology at Harvard University and he is also an alumnus of Yale University, uh, Vassar College and Trinity College of London. Thank you for your time today, sir. Uh, we would like to uh, showcase your vision about uh, education sector in India as well as Sai University to the prospective students and aspiring mm -hmm. students of the country. And uh, uh, sir, so being the Vice Chancellor of Sai University, mm -hmm. we would like to know how do you strategize about the key programs in uh, Sai University? Thank you. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Sai University is a very new university and is unique in India in many respects. Uh, after 40 years in the United States at major universities in major positions, having been the dean, a provost, a president, uh, I've decided to return to India because this is India's time. And Indian higher education is sorely in need of reform. <laughs> The young people in India know what the future brings or should bring. But much of higher education does not fulfill their potential, does not satisfy their aspiration, is stuck in a traditional way uh, of providing the kind of education that would enable our students to lead and to innovate uh, in their future. So I bring a number of innovations in the founding of Sai University. I'll mention two in particular. One is our unique international engagement. Okay. India now is a global power, economically, culturally, uh, and, uh, of course, the largest democracy in the world. For the first time in Indian history, in modern history, India is ready to take the lead in so many areas, but it has not yet taken the lead in higher education. Still, our talent goes abroad. Our top talent goes abroad. India is now the source of tremendous amount of talent, brain power, in all over the world. But India loses a lot of that. So it's time for India to establish some universities that are on par with the finest universities in the world. For example, the Ivy Leagues. And I've spent much of my life uh, at Ivy League institutions and there are many Indians who come there, but pay a fortune. Why not set that up in India? That's Sai University. So when I talk about our international standing, I don't just mean we have so many MOUs with foreign universities, or we have this semester abroad or that semester abroad. Of course, we will have all of those. But very few Indians can afford a semester abroad. A semester abroad at a top American college is twenty-five dollars or $30,000 just for tuition, plus room and board. <laughs> so what I'm doing is bringing the top faculty around the world and top thought leaders, industry leaders to India. Okay. And over my time in the U.S., I have developed a wide range of contacts and I've created a very powerful international advisory board. All of them, they're not just names and faces on our website. They are willing to interact with our students, not just give one-way lectures, but actually interact with our students so our students get to know them know their email address, can communicate with them. I'll give you just a few examples. John Mitchell is the chair, chairperson of the computer science department at Stanford University. He is 
involved with us. He has endorsed us <laughs> uh, and he is a visiting professor and he is actively teaching and interacting with our students. Uh, there is no university in India who has that. He is right in the center of Silicon Valley. He has been responsible for helping to spin off a number of companies you would have heard of, edX, Coursera, when he was vice provost of Stanford. Um, I'll give you uh, other examples. Michael Gazaniga, who is the founder of the field of cognitive neuroscience, you might have heard left brain versus right brain. We all talk about that. Well, that's all from him. He talks to our students now regularly and uh, can hook them up with international projects, with research projects. And they're also there to help our students think about postgraduate uh, work. Their list goes on, but the point is that our students at Sai University, undergraduate students, even in their first year, can develop personal contacts with some of the most important thought leaders of our time internationally. That is the most important, unique aspect of Sai. So our students, when they graduate, will be plugged into extremely powerful networks and contacts. Of course, students, you have to work hard to earn it. But uh, if you do work hard, you will have access uh, and entree into uh, becoming a part of a global network of thought leaders. The second strategic strength of Sai University, as I've devised it, is to integrate arts and sciences with technology. So there are liberal arts colleges in India, and they're actually liberal arts and sciences. You can major in any subject and you can combine subjects. But if you want to get a BTEC, you have to go to an engineering college. We have brought them together in the same integrated liberal ecosystem we call liberal arts, sciences, and technology. For now, we are limiting our BTEC to computer science and data science. Okay. So we have a school of arts and sciences, and we have a school of computing and data sciences. But for undergraduates, they're very, very much integrated. Okay, so that means you could, you could be getting a BTEC in computer science, but you can also take lots of courses in other subjects, music, uh, economics. Uh, you can combine data science with something like uh, public health, which we need very much today okay, with, with the pandemic, get, getting large sets of data on an issue that you might be passionate about, which is health and biology, and use your data science techniques to analyze those things. These unique combinations are where the opportunities will be in the future. The students who come out of colleges and universities being able to connect one dot here and one dot there from different courses, from different subjects, will be the entrepreneurs of the future. Because those are the ideas that have not been had before. Those are our two biggest strategic strengths at Sai. I will mention a third one, uh, which uh, is also important, which is what we call active in learning, active learning, okay? Enough of this boring lectures and then mugging up for exams and, 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 and rote learning and spitting back in the exam, okay? My field is cognitive neuroscience and I study how the brain learns. We have to adapt our education to how the brain learns, not try to force students to adapt to how we want to teach them, okay? So active learning means the teachers always engaging the students throughout the class by name, interactively, and you're assessed not just by one final exam, okay? You're assessed by your daily learning 
as you read, as you problem do solve problems, a lot of projects, a lot of works with peer groups, you and your other classmates working on things together, a lot of writing. When you go get a, when you get a job, they're not going to, on the job, you don't do exams, okay? You might have to write documents, you might have to write white papers, you might have to uh, uh, d design things and then, and then write those designs. All of those skills are missing from our education. So we are going to provide the key things that industry wants. Critical thinking and clear communication, spoken and written communication. If you show up for a job interview with the top companies in India, those are the two things that impress them the most. Are you able to take unique problems that have, that have not been in your textbook and analyze them, number one, and number two, articulate the problem and your possible solutions? At Sai University, next year, we are introducing a new undergraduate program. This is an integrated BA LLB program for five years. That allows students who want to become lawyers, to become qualified as lawyers, to also get a BA. And for the BA portion of it, there will be one major subject, which is political science, and two minor subjects, which will be economics and psychology. The integrated BA LLB is a way for law students to get that extra depth and breadth that more refined education that will put them in a stronger position in their career whether they work for a law firm or whether they work for a corporation or whether they go into leadership roles of any kind because the LLB alone, which is a three-year program, only trains in the technical aspects of the law. But increasingly these days, the top lawyers or the top legal advisors to corporations, to governments, or to policymakers have to know more than just the technical aspects of lawyering because after all the law applies to many many different areas it applies to the economy it applies to financial matters it applies to political matters and psychology plays a big role in legal affairs that's why for the BA LLB program, students also will be learning political science, economics, and psychology. Now, in addition to the integration of the LLB with the BA, the students in this five-year integrated BA LLB program will also be part of the larger integrated undergraduate ecosystem that we have already started this year with students in the School of Arts and Sciences and students in the School of Computing and Data Sciences. Okay? So students in the School of Arts and Sciences get a BA or a BSc and students in the School of Computing and Data Sciences get a BTEC and the BTEC can focus on computer science or data science or artificial intelligence or machine learning. We already have established an integrated undergraduate ecosystem where the students getting BA or BSc can also take some of the technical courses that are taken by the BTEC students and vice versa. So our BTEC students can get a lot of exposure to the arts and humanities and social sciences and the sciences. 
So now we are introducing a third school into this undergraduate ecosystem, which is the law school. And the integrated BA LLB program will enable those students to interact in and out of the classroom with the arts and sciences students and with the computing and data science students. Now, why would they want to do that? You might say, well, because a lot of the learning occurs through these interactions. So for example, a BA LLB student interacting with a, with a BTEC student doing computing and data science is going to learn a lot about the latest technology and that could be very useful information as a lawyer because lawyers increasingly have to deal with complex technological issues particularly in computing and data science for example uh, in computing uh, there are issues like a blockchain lawyers are going to be very much involved in disputes involving blockchain, which involves privacy issues, privacy of data, access to data, who gets to record the data, who gets to change the data. And the blockchain itself is a complicated system, which if lawyers don't understand, then how can they defend the clients or advise policymakers when blockchains are being used, which are they're being used now widely in almost every sphere of life, in uh, cryptocurrencies, which are growing very rapidly, in uh, real estate property transactions, uh, in all kinds of record keeping that uh, it will be used. For the data science, the relevance to law is obvious because data now uh, are everywhere and we have data about almost everything. Who owns the data? Whose intellectual property is it? Uh, what uh, are your rights for copying data, for utilizing other people's data? And what are your privacy rights as a citizen? So there are lots of connections there. And then in addition to political science, economics, and psychology, which are built into the five-year integrated BA LLB program. The law students might have an interest in the latest in, in the sciences. Uh, so for example, in, uh, in physics and biology, biological issues are also becoming very uh, litigious involving laws and lawyers will get involved in that because there are things like organ transplantation okay, that might involve legal issues. There are issues of in vitro fertilization, of the use of, of the purchasing, for example, of sperms or of eggs. And legal issues arise later on if, uh, if those agreements are not properly developed at the time. Uh, and a host of other issues involving the use of prosthetic devices. Increasingly, we will be having artificial arms, artificial legs, even artificial organs now are being discussed. Chips that are inserted into the body, into the brain, uh, if we have some brain damage. All of those issues which are, might involve biology, but they also are, involve uh, technical uh, issues and uh, issues that BTEC students might be studying become legal issues uh, as well. And so at Sai University, with our School of Arts and Sciences, our School of Computing and Data Science, and our School of Law, the students who come out of any of those programs are going to be far better prepared than other students in less interdisciplinary, in less integrated uh, educational systems because they will be able to 
connect the dots in different professions, connect the dots in different subjects, and add value to their clients, add value to society as policymakers. Uh, so you have uh, held experience in the foreign uh, <coughs> institutes uh, as well, and now you have also been looking into the education system of India. So, in your experience of this uh, conversion that uh, Sai University is bringing in the education system, what are the major challenges you are facing when you compare it, you know, to international institutes and uh, when to the typical uh, education system that is being employed in uh, India? So, what are the challenges that you are facing to bring this change and bring Sai University to be the you know forefront of this uh, change that we are bringing? I used to think the biggest challenge to bringing new forms of education to India would be the regulations, the government regulations. That is no longer the case. The government is now giving private universities a lot of space to be flexible. But the new education policy, the states are allowing private universities to come in and innovate. And that's why we've come in. The biggest challenge now is not government regulation, it's attitudes. That's where we have to really push the system and push the culture. The future dynamism of the global economy and the Indian economy will come from educating young people to take risks on new ideas. Not just to repeat the answers that are given in the book or given by your teacher, but to think independently, to integrate information from different sources, analyze it, come up with new ideas for new products, new services, new social enterprises, and that risk taking, I'm not talking about making, taking reckless risks. I'm talking about taking a risk on new ideas. That's what entrepreneurship is all about. That's where India still needs to take a big step forward. And the things that are holding it back are attitudes. Uh, our society is still too hierarchical. Uh, young people are, feel they have to wait their turn, you know, before they can take charge, before they can implement new ideas, before they can fly. Um, at Sai University, we attract students who want, they're hungry to be able to be in an environment where they can now fly. And we give them the wings to fly. We don't tell them where to fly or how to fly. We give them all of the skills and the knowledge and the space and the encouragement so that they can take those risks and achieve their highest aspirations. We all know Indians are fabulously successful abroad. Okay, It's time for those same creative groundbreaking leaders to thrive here. Uh, if we can do that, if we can unchain higher education from the shackles of prescriptive formulas, this is the course you have to take, you have to do this exam, this is the way you have to do it, this is how you have to do it, this is what you say, be quiet and just listen, we will not get there, okay? We flip it around so that the student, not the teacher, is at the center. And we're all born with unique passions, unique interests. No two people are the same. So you can't put the same stamp, the same template, the same formula on every single student. You have to see where each individual student's passions lie. And then the role of the teachers and the university is to provide the ecosystem 
in which that student can be the best version of themselves because that's where success comes from. Definitely, sir. Uh, sir, uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Jamshed, for uh, giving us this insightful uh, journey towards your vision and uh, what you envision uh, the education system of India to be in the coming years. Uh, so, as an ending note, uh, I would like uh, a few words that you would like to express to the young people, uh, like students who are aspiring to be, you know, looking forward to a dynamic job culture, looking for dynamic mm-hmm. careers, looking for entrepreneurship. And we can see this entrepreneurship wave going on in India in this couple of years, last couple of years. So for such students, uh, how, you know, as an ending note, what would be your uh, uh, tips or, uh, you know, your uh, uh, suggestions for them that uh, they can bring it to this uh, India and also how Sai University would be helping them achieve their dreams? Absolutely. An entrepreneurial culture is going to be the secret sauce for the future economic success of India. India has the talent and it also has the capital to invest in that talent. What it needs now is the will to take that talent, take some risks with that talent, invest in the talent and run with it. And so we want to, we produce students who come out understanding that if you lead with the things you love to do, that's when you're going to be most successful. And as an entrepreneur, uh, new companies necessarily have to be based on new ideas, right? And, And so we want to encourage students to test out new ideas, uh, to understand how to analyze them and to communicate them effectively so they can get uh, uh, people to invest in them, to support them, and uh, have a long enough runway so that they can become successful as entrepreneurs. It is not mugging up and uh, memorizing that makes a great entrepreneur. It's a well-rounded, well-educated, broadly educated, liberally educated student. Somebody who can see connections between two things that might come from different subjects. If you think about the great entrepreneurs, I mean, Stephen Jobs is the greatest example. He has produced the most successful computer company in history. He didn't get a BTEC in computer science. He didn't even get a BSc in computer science. His major was not even in computer science. He didn't go to a technical institute. When he's asked, what was the biggest influence you, you know, uh, from your college years in terms of courses that, that inspired Apple, he said, I happened to take a course in graphic design, graphic design. And suddenly he got this idea that you could use computers to do graphic design. And he combined really the technology of the personal computer, which was just emerging at the time, with a more artistic and design oriented uh, set of values to produce the Macintosh. A lot of people said, ah, that's a toy. You know, it's gonna fail. They predicted Apple's failure so many times in the beginning and look at it now. Everything, when you, when you touch an icon on your smartphone or you open a window or a menu or you click, you use the mouse, you point, you select, all of that was new with the first Macintosh. So for Stephen Jobs, he had this very strong belief that even though the market didn't exist at the time, he could create that market because he could produce something that was so compelling to young people, they would catch it. And this is another lesson in uh, entrepreneurship. In fact, uh, Clay Christensen from the Harvard Business School, who is the guru of innovation, (laughs) said the big mistake big business makes 
is thinking that you have to consult your customers before you launch a new product to see if they will. He said all the big companies, IBM, Xerox, uh, were brought down because they talked to their customers of these big mainframe computers and the customers said, we don't need personal computers. We don't need laptops. We don't need handhelds. You know, we just need these big central computers. So you have to have the confidence that the next generation of, of customers who are usually young people, your peers, are going to latch on to something and, and express the express the values and the passions of your gen your young generation and realize those dreams and you will develop the market for your uh, startup company and you'll be a successful entrepreneur if you just try to create something that's already been done uh you will fail because you cannot compete with the established companies on doing what they're doing already and Sai University is the place to set you up. We have the board uh, of some of the finest entrepreneurs in India. Mr. Narayana Murthy founded Infosys. Okay. Uh, we have our own founder, Mr. K.B. Ramani, founded Future Software. Okay. And it's those thinkers who had these this confidence before computers were big in India, who have now made India the number one exporter of software in the world. <clears throat> Definitely, sir. Your uh, inspiring words must have instilled uh, the aspiration in the students to look forward to such courses and, uh, you know, to try a, a career in this dynamic uh, process of selecting what uh, they want and mixing their passion with their, uh, you know, career path as well. So I believe this would uh, uh, attract a lot of more students to get more information about Sai University in the future and uh, in, attract them towards your courses and the uh, change that we are bringing, sir. Thank you for your valuable time today. And uh, I hope that today every student got a bit of inf new information uh, in this uh, sector and uh, are uh, looking to rethink about their strategy about uh, changing their careers in the current years. Thank you very much. My pleasure.